Okay, we are live with my guest, Ralph Ellis. It's a fascinating author who has expressed many uh, very uh, unusual or uh, unorthodox ideas about how to interpret the Bible. Um, he's a British author who has published uh, one interesting idea uh, after another, and uh, that would also interest people in the Christ mythicist and Roman provenance areas of biblical research. Welcome, Mr. Ellis. Yeah, thanks for having me on. Good to be with you. Excellent. Um, could you please give us a brief description of your book, Jesus, King of Edessa? Yes, well, that was uh, towards the end of my research, so I didn't start with that book, of course, but uh, that finalizes who Jesus was in the historical record, um, because I had previously found him as a character within the works of Josephus Flavius, but that was just a, a, a character in a chronicle which a lot of people said was not necessarily true. You know, it, okay, right. Well, we're so, not so, go ahead, sir. We, we're not certain that everything that uh, Josephus Flavius tells us is actually true. And so I looked further into it and I at last found who this character was because he was not obviously um, visible in the historical record. But I found a, um, a new monarchy which I didn't know anything about at the time. Um, and research them further and it, yes it does indeed seem that they are the um the particular royal family that the gospel is talking about because of course jesus was born as a king of the jews and he died as the king of the jews so you know i was looking for who this king could be you know how can you lose the king from historical record um well you can if the romans don't want that king uh, to be known about. Um, and yeah, they deliberately deleted him from the historical record, which is why he's so difficult to find. Okay, that's an interesting hypothesis. Um, have you responded to Dr. Bart D. Ehrman's assessment of the King Abgar legend? Ah, I must read. Uh, I, I tend not to read what other authors have written. I don't want to be um, influenced by what other people are talking about. Uh, I must read what Ehrman has said about Abgar because I didn't know he had actually commented on this um, oh. issue. Okay, now uh, Wikipedia says the scholar Barty Ehrman cites evidence from Hans Drievers and others for regarding the whole correspondence as forged in the third century by Orthodox uh, Christians and yeah, as well, an anti manichaean polemic. Yeah, well, I know Drivers because I was in correspondence with him. Uh, he wrote a, uh, a paper on uh, the doctrine of Adai um, uh, we, we'll go into this later, the Doctrine of Adai document, which details the, the correspondence between Jesus and uh, King Agbar, um, uh, sorry, King Abgarus of Edessa, who's this key character, this key king that I'm talking about. And uh, I, I had to disagree with drivers. I, I put... Um, when he finally published his, his paper, because he was working on it at the same time as I was working on my book, that's why we were in correspondence. And when he finally finished his, uh, his paper after my book had been published, I sent him 20 questions uh, asking him to clarify because I didn't believe what he said was true and he refused to answer any of my questions. I see. So, yeah, I, uh, there are scholars who don't wish to find any evidence. <laughs> so, I mean, it's true. It's true. Well, it Just seems like they're they're defending an existent hypothesis that that they yeah, have. Precisely, um, and and so if it degree if it disagrees with uh, their belief system, they will try and interpret it maybe as 
uh, mythology or you know inaccurate history or whatever but he certainly wasn't looking at this as being a possible truth and that's why i think he erred uh and there was there was one part that he missed out completely oh yes he was talking about king abgarus and he never mentioned the fact that king abgarus was married to queen helena we're getting ahead of ourselves here um, a little bit because listeners might not know these characters, but she is one of the key characters who appears in in biblical type um, correspondence and history. And he didn't mention that this king was married to this famous queen. And how can earth can you how on earth can you investigate Odessa if you don't mention Queen Helena? It right. was all that uh, strange. May so. I may, may I say something about Queen Helena? Is yes. is is she related to the idea of the Helena attached to Simon Magus? Yeah, so I'll, well, I think so. Uh, lots of people don't, but I I think they are linked. I think there is a definite link there with with the Simon Magus. Um, uh, story. Um, there's also a link with the uh, Constantine story as well, because I think they copied Queen Helena. Um, so the, the 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 more famous story about Saint Helena, which listeners might be getting confused with, um, that's not the queen we're talking about. You know, Saint Helena was the mother of um, of Constantine, Emperor Constantine. Okay. Do you and do I you identify? Oh, I'm sorry, sir. I think they modelled the mother of Constantine on the original Queen Helena, who was a first century queen, a real first century queen, because they wanted to get rid of Queen Helena. And it was very difficult to get rid of her because she was well known. Well, you could very easily say, oh, you know, you're, you're mistaken. That, that was the mother of Constantine. You're talking about the wrong Queen Helena. And I, I think they deliberately did that in order to sideline the original first century queen helena i see is queen helena or or any helena should be should she should be identified as sophia of the gnostics as representing wisdom i'm sure she would have been um i think we ought to introduce these characters though to listeners because i think they might be confused as to um what we're talking about um the gospel story is about a king um, it's about a royal family. There are many allusions to that within the um, gospel stories that uh, Jesus was a king. Uh, you know, that's and, and also a king that was somehow linked to the Parthian or Persian Empire because of the three wise men who came to his birth. You know, why they, they were the Magi, you know, the, uh, the priesthood and the kingmakers of, of uh, Persia. Why would they come to a birth of a Jewish child prince perhaps in Judea or Syria it doesn't really make sense unless we have some sort of Persian Parthian connection to this family so what we're looking for is is a royal family uh, early first century born in a state of poverty for some reason I mean why would a royal family be born in a stable or a, uh, a, a common house um and who was regarded as, as royal by the um, Persian Magi. Um, the nativity story doesn't really make a lot of sense unless you know the history. And since this is a hidden history, a lot of people would never be able to make the connections because as I said previously, this particular royal family has been deleted from history deliberately. Um, I mean, you can go through the works of Josephus Flavius. Now, this is a guy who knows everything that happened in the first century. He names uh, every pauper and pimp uh, who ever lived in, in Judea in, in that era. But he doesn't mention this royal family. So you can do a, a word search in the works of Josephus and, and search for Edessa, because that's where they came from, uh, which is in northern Syria. Uh, or you can search for the royal family. You can search for Abgarus, the king, or Manu, his son. Uh, and the word search will just say, uh uh, nothing found. They've been yeah. deleted from history. And so that's why we have to go searching for other names, perhaps other titles, 
to find this particular royal family. And, you know, this has caused some consternation with uh, other researchers saying, well, you can't have different names. Well, I'm, I'm sorry, you, you must have different names because those real names were deleted from history on the audience uh, of Emperor Vespasian. Well, doesn't it uh, doesn't it seem that the Christian cults are renaming everybody? Simon becomes Peter uh, yep. anyway. Uh, they, they do. Uh, and they do so for many reasons. They do so because the language changes. Uh, so Simon. Um, yeah, well, Simon was his name. And then he was given the title Peter because it means rock. And then we get Kephas, which is the same title, obviously, in the Aramaic instead of the Greek. And so he ends up with three names. And many of the disciples have, you know, one of them's even got five names I counted. Um, uh, Amazing. Judas, Thomas, Didymus, uh, Thaddeus. Um, yeah, they have many names because of the different changes in language and also because they were given titles. These are not all names, of course. Peter was given... Um, the name Simon was given the name Peter because he was the keeper of the rock. And we might go through this later, but the, the, the basis of this religion was a sacred rock, a sacred meteorite, which had been kept in that region for, for thousands of years. You know, it started in Egypt as the Ben Ben, it went across to Egypt as the uh, Omphala stone. And then it went to, uh, well, it went actually to Parthia with, uh, and I think it went with um, Alexander the Great when the Greeks took over the whole of Parthia, all of Persia. Um, and then it came back and it came back to Edessa. So it came back to this same region that we've been talking about, where it was called the Elagabal. Uh, and that's why we have an emperor of Rome called Elagabalus, uh, uh, circa sort of about 220 AD. Emperor Elagabalus took the uh, sacred stone to Rome, where it became the central symbol of the Roman Empire, but it was not greatly appreciated in Rome. Uh, and so he was murdered and the stone was kicked out of Rome after only about seven years, I think. And then the, the, the cult of the Elagabal became uh, Sol Invictus, which readers might know a little bit better. And this right. stone disappears from history. But without going into it any deeper than that, there was a sacred stone in this region. It was revered by certain priests, and we can go into that later. One of those certain priests was the um, uh, the Church of Jesus and James, because the priests who venerated this stone uh, were called the uh, Galileans, the same as Jesus. And um, what else about this stone? Um, well, yes, yeah, sorry, that's why Simon was called Peter. He was called the stone. He was the rock. Not necessarily the rock upon which this church was founded, but the keeper of the sacred stone, because there was a sacred stone in this region. And we know there was a sacred stone because we've got images of it. Um, there were lots and lots of coins um, from Greece, from Syria, and from Rome that have this sacred stone. Um, upon the coins. So we know what it looks like. Okay. You um, had mentioned that it, it has some relationship to the Omphalo stone, and, and that yes. would be perhaps Apollo or Orphic cults. Uh... Yes, but it goes back earlier than that. It goes back to Egypt and the uh, primeval mound from Egypt. So that's a very, very Oh, ancient, this, right. Early... The Ben Ben, this is the, ben -ben. Uh, this is the guy who is their Atom, Atom. That's yes. the creator of the cosmos for the Egyptians. Yeah. Yes, the Atom, which is, ha, has great uh, similarities with Eden, of course, and the Garden of Eden. Atom. Right. The, the T and the D are always um, transliterated in, um, or transposed, I should say, within Aramaic and Hebrew, because they look, um, uh, sorry, the T and the D. No, that's within Egyptian. It's the uh, D and the R within Aramaic are always uh, okay. Well, uh, you, you can notice T and D trading off between Latin yeah. and Greek, in fact, yeah. between Theos and Deos and, and this sort of stuff. You do, yes. Okay. Um, do you see Jesus as a tyrannous? As a, as a what? A tyrannous, a temporary, a very temporary king. 
No, he was part of a royal line. Um, uh, this is why he was so important, uh, because the other peculiarity of the gospel story is why was anyone in, interested in this particular prince? Um, okay, they've transposed him into a into a carpenter, but that's the wrong translation. He was never a carpenter. Um, uh, the word being used is a tecton, which means um, a mason, uh, an architect. You, you can hear the Greek in the word architect. So he was a, an architect, he wasn't a carpenter, and he was more of a speculative architect uh, than an operative architect. In other words, Jesus was a Freemason. Um, and that's why we have all of these uh, allusions to rocks and to uh, uh, building within the gospel stories. Okay, um, um, can I ask a question about Paul? Why is he teaching from the Hall of the Tyrannus at Ephesus? Well, <clears throat> that's that's getting rather ahead of ourselves. Um, Saul was was not a part of the Church of Jesus and James. Uh, he ducked out of that very very quickly. Um, so he was obviously closely linked to this family. Um, he was obviously a, a prince, I think, of the royal, the same royal family, and he probably thought that he was greater than Jesus and James. But uh, he started off on his first missionary tour as um, he was uh, evangelizing for the church of Jesus and James. But he didn't get very good responses. And so he went to James and he asked if he could uh, uh, preach to the Gentiles instead. And James said yes. So off he went on his second tour and he was preaching to the Gentiles. So he was preaching a very, very different gospel to uh, the gospel that Jesus, that Jesus and James was preaching, uh, which is why I say, because Christianity came from Saul. It didn't come from Jesus and James. And Saul became the enemy of Jesus, of course. You know, the two churches were at each other's, other's throats. And so, as I always say, anyone who is a Christian is actually believing in the um, in the religion of the enemy of Jesus. Okay, so so in Jesus and James. Okay, so you're saying that that Jesus's kingship comes from the Adiabene kingship and not from the mythic hero pattern like Buddha's kingship. Yes, well, we, we, you know, we have the, we have the two sides of this story, and I'm in, in the middle of it. You know, we have the. Um, um, uh, we have the mythicists who, who think this story is, is entirely uh, mythical because it cannot be found in the historical record. I mean, they've got, you know, good arguments backing them up because this, this history cannot be found in the historical record. Um, and then we've, we've got the, um, uh, I forget what they call them now, the, 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 the true believers who believe every word there is in the Gospels because it's you know, the word of God. And there's not very much in between those two positions at present. Um, but I've developed my theory right in the middle of those two positions, because I'm saying this is real history. So I, I'm following the believers in, in, <laughs> in that respect. Right. But the true history is not as it's been taught. It is radically different, uh, different to the story that has been peddled by the uh, church, because they've turned it into a uh, into a fairy story instead of a real history. I see. Um, so I, I say that they've taken the real history and they've covered it in fairy dust. Because it's the same. <laughs> okay. It's the same story. Um, the history is the same, and that's why they get upset with me because. I say, well, I found Jesus in the historical record. I can prove that your gospels are true. And they will say, no, 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 please don't do that because your Jesus is not the Jesus that we want, you know? Right. They want this uh, sandal wearing pauper prince of peace. And that is not who he was. The Jesus it's, that I've yeah. discovered in the historical record was a warrior king who was fighting against Rome which if you read the Gospels with uh, an open mind, that is exactly what the Gospels were actually saying. They're, they seem to be making uh, Jesus a duplicitous character, a, a divided 
sort of character, almost, almost like a yes. syncrastic, a, a syncretism himself. Yeah, well, they have to because they've got this history and they're trying to make it into a Rome friendly history. And so you've got to twist it and turn it. And not every aspect of the story gets turned in the right direction. So, yeah, there are huge contradictions. The whole of the New Testament is a dichotomy. He's a pauper prince of peace, and yet he sends his di disciples off to go and, and buy swords. He's, he's a prince of peace, but he forecasts, you know, that the, the temple will be destroyed, et cetera, et cetera. Um, yeah, all the way through it. Even worse, in Acts of the Apostles, uh, if you remember the story of Ananias and uh, Sapphira, I think her name was, um, the, the Church of Jesus and James was a sort of um, a communist, Marxist sort of outfit. Uh, they lived from the common purse and you had to give all of your money to the, um, uh, to the church when you joined the church. And Ananias and, and his wife uh, held back some of their property. They didn't give all their property to the church. And so St. Peter uh, killed them both. I, I mean, see. That's not if you remember that story okay well um, he's the rock the rock kills jesus ben and Annius, right uh <laughs> yeah let me think about that one um <laughs> yes i suppose okay. yes you're right yes <laughs> well i'm just saying that could be a spin-off a legend or or something uh just a, a, an alternative way of expressing it um okay uh it did king abbar uh now we would be talking Isates with with that person if i understand it correctly Did, was he a destroyer of anything like a temple well perhaps we ought to define who these people are again please first. Otherwise please we, yes we will um uh, confuse people once please more. please do so um we we have two monarchies and the question is are they two monarchies or are they the same monarchy because I think they're the same monarchy because of all of this name deletion business that's gone on in history. So we have this monarchy in the works of Josephus Flavius, who is called the Kings of Adiabeni. The trouble is with Adiabeni, and the queen was, of course, this famous Queen Helena. She was the queen of Adiabeni. Uh, and she was married to Monobazus, the king of, uh, of Adiabeni. Now, the trouble is these names don't look as though they are real names. I mean, Monobazus to me uh, is a, a bastardized Greek version of the only king, Monobasilus. Um, it just means the only king. Um, so that's not a proper title, I don't think. That's just a made up title. And Adia Beni has never been found. Um, people keep saying it's. Um, Arbella, which is over by Mosul down in uh, uh, Iraq. But there is no uh, archaeological evidence for Adiabeni, none at all. It's mentioned in several texts, but it's mentioned in a fashion that I deem to be impossible. So some of the Roman emperors in a passage that seems to be copied uh, from emperor to emperor, because it seems remarkably the same amongst four different emperors, um, who say they went down into Adia Beni and they conquered the place and they became Parthica, the kings of Parthi Parthia. Um, well, that's Parthia. simply not true because, you know, the greatest enemy of Rome was was Parthia, Persia, and the Romans lost, you know, four legions over there. They were soundly whipped on every occasion. And there's no way that the Roman army could, could stroll down into uh, deep into Iraq um, without facing any losses, which is apparently what happened according to these Roman accounts. And so I've deemed uh, Adia Beni to be fictitious. It was not down there all the way down uh, past Mosul. Um, so what's you know what's the truth here? Can we can we divine the truth from this? And I think we can because we have records from Syria, and this is the beauty of this, you know some of the work I've been doing, and I don't know why other people have not uh, done this before me, 
is we have the works of Josephus and they are highly biased, of course, because Josephus was working for Rome. He was paid by Emperor Vespasian to write these books and he wrote it in a Rome friendly fashion. And if Vespasian said, delete Edessa from your books, then that's exactly what he did. And that's why you cannot find Edessa within the works of Josephus. But we know Edessa existed because we, it, it's in modern Turkey now, it's San Lurfa. We know it existed, we know it was uh, a kingdom, we have its coins, we have some of its history. And the Syriac historians who write similar stories to Josephus Flavius, write them in a different fashion. And one of the things that they say is that this queen, this famous Queen Helena of Adiabeni, first century, um, the lady we've been talking about, was married to King Abgarus of Edessa. Okay, so now we have a direct link between Adiabeni and Edessa. And okay, you could say that they control both of those cities, but I don't think that's true because there's no evidence that uh, um, Adiabeni was ever down by Mosul. I think that when Josephus mentions Adiabeni, that's his cover story for Edessa because he was not allowed to mention Edessa. So he calls it Adiabeni and he locates it, you know, another 300 kilometers, you know, further down towards the uh, southeast from its true position, which is in northern Syria. Okay, like, well, you know, it seems that Josephus and Philo are, are the only sort of primary type sources you would have for Pontius Pilate. Uh, why are the Romans letting Jews write the history of Pontius for us? Well, because this was a Jewish story. None of the Romans knew what was going on. Um, and so hello? they had a, they had a, uh -oh. hello, can you, can you hear me? Wait a minute. Let me see. Okay. All Hello? right. I'm I'm sorry I've lost your sound. Oh, uh, okay. I have lost your sound. Sorry about that. And I don't know why. Uh, I'm um, still recording here. I don't yes. know why I would have lost it. Maybe I hit something I shouldn't have. Um let me go ahead and kill a few things here. Okay. Um we should be live. We are still live. Hello, let me hello. let me see why I can't hear you. Let me re reroute this sound. I'll go ahead and cut this all out uh, after we've concluded. Um, let me Is see. Your headset still in? Oh my! Well, everything was going so fine. I'm going to pause this recording a moment. Of my and now, now I now we now are live, sir. Yeah, OK. Thank you. And continuing with Ralph Ellis. Let me get my sheet back yes, up Yes, we here. were talking What's about uh, Adiabeni, so I'm not entirely sure where we left off there. All right. Um, well, it, it's coming down to, to whether you believe the Adiabeni story uh, that you're presenting relates to history or whether it's myth. Um, I, I, what is, where is Paul in this? Maybe, maybe that would help us. I... Um, no, the, what, what will really help us in this is um, the works of Josephus. So what did, why did jo Josephus write his books? Well, Josephus was working for Rome, of course. He was working for Emperor Vespasian. Oh, yes, you were asking um, uh, why why we should we should trust uh, Josephus well uh, or Philo the Romans right. yeah yeah you were you were asking why um uh why didn't Rome just write their own books well about um, Pilot yeah yeah about Pilot so um they already had a pet Jew uh Rome did not know this history this this was Judaic history this was outside their normal remit um, they wanted to tell this story. They needed someone who knew this story to tell it for them in a Rome-friendly format. And Josephus was that man because he had fought in the Jewish revolt and he had turned 
um, to working for Rome. He was working for Emperor Vespasian during the Jewish revolt. He was trying to get the Jews to surrender to Rome. Um, he was Rome's puppet, and not only a puppet, but he was a propaganda minister. He was highly effective as a propaganda minister. Uh, and he was a historian and an author. I mean, he was just ideal. He knew the story. He knew the whole of Judaism. He wrote his own version of the Old Testament, all the way from Adam and Eve, all the way through, um, you know, to the Maccabeans. He knew the whole history. He was just perfect for the job. And so he wrote the history of the Jewish revolt, uh, you, which is you called Bellum. You make him sound like Joseph Goebbels, though. <laughs> oh, if you read him, that's exactly what he was. Exactly what he was. E every bit of it is, is Roman propaganda written from a Roman perspective for his Roman patrons because they were paying for it. Uh, and now, what did he do with this book? He wrote the history of the Jewish revolt. Now, he didn't write it for Rome. And most people don't understand this, although it's the first thing that Josephus says. He did not write this book for Rome. He wrote it for the um, Babylonian Jews who were beyond the Euphrates. OK, so now who are the Jews beyond the Euphrates? Well, we've only got two groups. One is Adiabeni and the other one is Edessa. Both of those groups were Jewish and they resided beyond the Euphrates. Not only that, he actually states in, in his opening um, paragraphs that the Jews who started the uh, Jewish revolt in Judea were hoping for support from these Jews uh, beyond the Euphrates. And you've got to ask yourself, why would, you know, Jews in, in Iraq come, you know, marching all the way over to Judea to fight against the Romans? Um, well, it's because they were the Edessan monarchy and the Edessan monarchy had a very large army. We knew about that. Uh, the Edessans were actually Jews. We know about that because the Talmud tells us that the queen, the famous queen Helena again, um, she became a Nazarene Jew the same sect, of course, as, as Jesus and, and uh, Saul were both Nazarenes. Um, she became a Nazarene Jew along with the rest of the royalty in Edessa. And that's what the letters in the Doctrine of Adai were all about when Jesus was supposed to be writing um, to the Edessan monarchy. Um, this was, again, a lot of this was about them um, converting over to Nazarene Judaism. Um, okay, can, can I ask, have you heard of the term the Eber Nari? Because they are the ones who have crossed the river or, or the, something the, along those lines. You mean the Ebionites? Mm, no, well, I'm saying specifically Eber Nari, that would mean the Hebrews are the over the river people is what it would mean, the, the river yes. crossers. This supposedly was used to, would, would have uh, applied to any Jew in, Jew in Israel, that they were across the... Uh, the Euphrates, and they were, in fact, also across uh, Jordan. Yes, uh, it, it's, it's not entirely clear what that refers to, because the Jews cross many rivers, of course. Um, you know, they they, um, they cross the Red Sea, they cross the, the Jordan during the uh, Exodus. Um, I, I don't know entirely what that will refer to. Okay, no, um, nor I, nor I, but uh, and thank you for uh, making it clearer that uh, mm. it's it's an unclear term. <laughs> uh, it, so, um, so we were coming back to the kings, uh, the monarchy of, of of Edessa, and how they are linked to the um, biblical story. Um, again, listeners won't know of of the uh, kings of Edessa. Uh, because they've been deleted from history. And modern historians and modern theologians will not address this issue. So when I brought up the case of, of Adia Beni back in 2000, and when did this book come out? 2015, I think, maybe a bit earlier, 2014, something like that. Okay. Um, nobody knew what Odessa was. Uh, virtually, absolutely nobody knew what Odessa was in this field of, of research. And they were all questioning, of course, why am I bringing up um, Odessa into this story? 
and linking it with the Gospels. Well, if you look into Acts of the Apostles, it says that Agabus um, saw the uh, famine, which we think was the famine of AD 47, and gave uh, financial assistance to Jerusalem to alleviate this, this famine, this great famine. Well, we know what that famine was. This was the famine that was given money by Queen Helena of Edessa. Um, she is the one who gave the money uh, to Jerusalem. So it's quite obvious when the Acts of the Apostles is saying that this money was given by Agabus, that they're actually talking about Abgarus, the king of Edessa, Abgarus V. Uh, who was alive at that time, and his wife was <laughs> Queen Helena of Edessa, and they were the people who gave this uh, money to Jerusalem to alleviate the famine. And the funny thing is, is that money was given by the hands of Saul and Barnabas. Okay. Now, now do you see how close to the gospel story this Edessan royal family was? Saul and Barnabas were ambassadors of Edessa. Right. It also sounds a little bit like the, the Simon Magus story of trying to buy the gift of, of the Holy Spirit or salvation. Yeah, well, that, that, that was slightly different because that was a take on Judas being paid 40, you know, um, 40 um, uh, coins of silver. Um, so that's slightly different. But the, 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 the main point is that Edessa was central to this story because Saul and Barnabas was, were the ambassadors to Edessa. Now, that drags Edessa right back into the gospel story. And yet nobody within the church has ever mentioned Edessa. And no one in, in the likes of Ehrman and um, uh, Carrier and many of the other researchers we have in the more modern era has ever mentioned Edessa, when it is actually key to understanding the gospel history. So I think a lot of people have not done their homework very well. They've not joined up the dots and, and seen where this links in. I think that a lot of people have taken this history rather too literally. I mean, you look at um, uh, Richard Carrier, for instance, and he's based his entire thesis on the fact that the gos the gospels are all mythology in other words there's no history almost within it at all well it's no wonder that he can't find any real history uh within the gospel story because he regards the whole thing as mi as mythological so he's he's never going to find any truths Right. Well, to, but, but to be fair, he does consider uh, Paul an actual person. He does consider uh, Pilate actual. But he doesn't consider Jesus to be an actual person. Right. So he's, right. He's never going to find Jesus in the historical record, is he? OK, let's um, let's let's talk about Acts for a second, if I could, please. Mm -hmm. um, in Acts, Saul and Barnabas are compared to Hermes and Zeus. Yeah. Um, and and I I wonder is if they're making an attempt to make this Roman friendly or why would good Jewish Christians use the name Saul Paulus when it sounds so much like Saul Apollo? <laughs> well, um, speaking no, of the Paul, sun cult, OK, <laughs> no, Paul just means little. It means junior. OK, So Paul was was Saul junior. So he was the he was the younger of the two. That's why you get Saul and Barnabas, um, with Barnabas being um, called Jupiter, and it, you had the Greek versions, and and Saul being called Mercury. Right. Okay. Because one is the elder brother, and one is the fiery little youngster, and that's why he was called Paul because he was Paul Junior. Um, right. He was the younger he was the younger brother of Barnabas. That's why they were going off on this evangelical tour together. Um, because I have Paul Saul being born much later than Christians will allow. I say he was born in AD 37. And, you know, the theologians and the modern theologians will all jump up in, and down and say, that's impossible because, you know, he was going on 
Uh, his evangel evangelical tours in AD 52 was his first one, 52, 53, something like that. Right. Um, so he was far too young. Well, well, no, because as a Jew, of course, he became a man aged 14, which was in uh, at his bar mitzvah, where, you know, after you had see. your bar mitzvah, you are a man. You can get married. You can have children at 14. Right. Well, right. that would have been AD 51. So, uh, yes, of course, he can go off on his evangelical, evangelical tours in AD 52. Okay. And it doesn't matter that he was very young. And, and the uh, comparison I always give is, is, you know, if you're in Europe and you get a couple of guys knocking on your door, you know, a couple of um, Mormons, what do you get? Do you get a couple of old geezers at your door trying to spread Mormonism? Or do you get a couple of youngsters? Well, I don't know if you've ever had it over where you are, but we're, they're very common uh, over in uh, in Britain. Oh, yes. And you, oh, yes. You get a couple of youngsters. You get a guy of about 18 and you get a guy of about 16 going off on their missionary tours across Europe. That's exactly what you get. You get youngsters who have not yet settled down, who don't have the... Um, the uh, uh, the the uh, problems with you know having a family and you know earning a living and all of the rest of that. Uh, so you send out the youngsters. You don't send out right. old people. E and even that's the, exactly what happened. Right. Even Jehovah's Witnesses is, is yeah. known known for that here. And then the joke goes that they don't celebrate Halloween because they don't want strangers coming up to their door. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> okay. So. Um, what do you think of Paul in Ephesus uh, regarding the making of cult I, uh, icons to uh, Diana of Ephesus or Artemis? Well, he was the um, apostle to the Gentiles, wasn't he? And he was trying to have syncretism between Judaism and uh, Roman religion. I mean, that was his whole philosophy. Um, I tend to say he, well, A, he was the apostle to the Gentiles, and that happened very early. That probably was sort of AD 57-ish, maybe 56, something of that nature. He had already been sent out by Jesus, uh, by James um, as the apostle to the Gentiles, and he wasn't preaching Nazarene Judaism. Um, he was preaching his own, I call it simple Judaism, because he was given just four basic rules instead of the whole of the books of, you know, Deuteronomy and Leviticus. Right. He, he was given just four rules of simple Judaism, which were, you know, don't drink blood, don't eat strangled animals, don't eat animals sacrificed to other gods or something, and, and uh, don't indulge in forni fornication. And that was it. So they had distilled the whole of Judaism down into four simple rules. And that was the church that Saul was preaching to his uh, Gentile uh, followers. So yeah, he was preaching a very, very different church to right. Jesus and James. The, the, Sadduc so. the Sadducees, for instance, would, would have very much objected to someone like Paul. Oh yeah, uh, undoubtedly. But he was very pro-Roman and that's why Rome cottoned onto him very, very early. Uh, and when he was sent to Rome, in circa, I don't know, AD 62, something of that nature, when he was sent by ship on that prison ship going to Rome, I say he was turned at that point and became a spy working for Rome. I see. Um, Fascinating. Because, well, because one of the big things, I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but one of the big things in my work, one of the first things in my work, uh, which identified all of this story, is who was Saul in the historical record? Okay. We don't know. This is the problem with all of these works in the Old Testament as well as the New Testament, is all of these characters are missing from the historical record. So how on earth do you lose Saul, who's the most important person in the last 2,000 years? This is the guy who wrote the New Testament. Well, now, now the guy... Now the that you mention all that you mentioned, it reminds me of what's said in the Bible that they used to send out two spies 
or something oh, yes, they, from the Old it, Testament. Is that not yes, true? Yes, they did in into Judea to go and spy out Judea. Yes, they were. Um, they were. Uh, they were the two vine keepers or something. They were sent out. They're always portrayed with with a bunch of grapes. The two spies. Oh, really? No, 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 no. Oh, I, yeah. I see. I I love iconography and I love yes. symbology. So that's that's the type of stuff I study. Since it, since it's really not been the the focus of history. Yeah, there's a good image of that in the uh, Hukuk uh, mosaic, which was only discovered about. You know, uh, can, uh, can you two, spell two, that for? Ago. Can you spell that for me so I can Google H it? H U Q U uh, Q again, I think. Hukok. All right then, excellent. Um, and it's a it's a fairly famous mosaic that was only discovered about three years ago, and it has lots of these images um, on it. And one okay. of them is of the two spies and a bunch of grapes because they were in the vineyard or they were pretending to be vintners or something okay um, let me ask you if you use a source have a quintus or excuse me quintus curtius rufus in, in what regard I, I was just wondering if you used uh quintus curtius rufus who was a oh. i think a historian of of the first century or I've, I've used but, but whose, so whose many publications were held up uh, apparently by the the royals or something so they may have actually redacted him and you know i i have no idea i just was curious about that because i am personally uh researching rufus a little bit okay yeah but, no, but i find him an enigmatic character that i can't prove was anything but a false identity for someone is what it, what he seems like Many of them were. I mean, things like the Doctrine of Adai, we don't know who actually wrote it. Um, and uh -huh. we don't know if it's um, mythical or real. But having read it and read it in, in the guise of my research, I regard it as being actually mostly true. Um, all of these stories have have you know changes to them because they're they're pushing a certain agenda okay um, so they they all have their particular bias but i regard it as being actually quite true the reason why everyone says it's mythical is because jesus was writing to king abgarus in the ad 40s and that's a bit of a problem of course so you know for various reasons, Christians have to throw it out. But I think they're throwing out the baby with the bathwater because the, the, the whole of my thesis revolves around what I call the chronological chasm, um, which is the gap between the fabricated history of the Gospels and the true history. Um, so the fabricated story happened in the AD 30s, of course. That's when Jesus was supposed to have been crucified. But he was actually crucified in AD 70. And so we have this 40-year gap between the true history and the, the, the fantasy history. And, and we know that he was uh, crucified in AD 70 because we have a story from Josephus. He actually tells us he has this vignette of of the leaders of the the three leaders of the jewish revolt um being crucified in the kidron valley in ad 70 after the jewish revolt had ended yes and josephus himself uh sees them being crucified remembers them as being his former compatriots remember he had changed sides and gone over to the Romans. And so he asked the governor for them to be taken down early. They were taken down early by Josephus of Arimathea and two of them died and one of them survived. Familiar I see. story? Uh, it's well, yes, the, where, the where have we heard it's it? The, yeah, it's the, crucifixion, it's the crucifixion event. But of okay. course, in Josephus version, um, Joseph of Arimathea becomes Josephus Flavius. And there are good reasons why people would not want to admit that because no one would want um, Josephus Flavius as being the guy who takes Jesus down from the cross. Um, he's, he's the most 
slippery and duplicitous person ever in the history of man. So okay. you would not want to have, mention Joseph as Flavius. Have you heard of the crucifixion of Marcius? Uh, no, I think you're going off topic again. Um, okay. All right. Sorry. I just, I, I didn't mean to mention a famous Greco-Roman religious crucifixion, you know, in the same context as mm. something that's totes Hebrew or, or whatever. Uh, uh, it seems to me that the bias has been to see things through both the Jewish and the Roman lens a little uh, too much. In other words, what we know of the Roman lens, we don't really have much of a lens. Okay, and so it comes out as whatever the particular Jews who were recording history for the Romans tell us. In other words, everything comes back to two sources in most people's thinking, and that's Joe and Philo, Josephus and Philo, or and then the no, I think the main the, the main trouble is that uh, within Christian theology, they have divorced this history completely from the history that, and politics that surrounds it. So you would not, if, if you came through uh, Sunday school and read the New Testament, you would not know that this was a Roman story. I mean, the Romans just don't take any part in it. But if, if this story was to do with the Jewish revolt, which it plainly was, this is a Roman story. And yet nobody will talk about the politics of this era, um, why these events were happened. Uh, why was Jesus involved in some sort of revolt from Rome? In fact, people won't even acknowledge that. They will say he's a peacenik, but it clearly states um, in the Gospels that Jesus was jailed alongside revolutionaries who had committed murder in the revolution. Okay. okay. Uh, so they... which okay. revolution was this? Right. Um, we, there seems to be gaps in when you would expect to see Jewish rebellion or something then that you don't, that other well, authors... Well, there's, there's an obvious rebellion that it's talking about, and that's AD 70, the great Jewish revolt. But the trouble is you come back to this chronological chasm again. People cannot believe this because it means that Jesus was alive and fermenting a revolt in the 1860s. But what's happened, of course, is, is they've deliberately pushed this history back by 40 years. Um, look at it from my perspective. Jesus was the leader of the Jewish revolt. And there are many reasons uh, we, we can go through that prove that he was the leader of the Jewish revolt. The Romans were writing this story, courtesy of Joseph of Flavius. Um, who was their chief, you know, um, chronicler of, of all of these events. And they didn't want anyone praising a rebel who had fermented a revolt against Rome. That's the last thing they wanted. They wanted peace in the eastern uh, borders of their empire. They didn't want another revolt. And so by all means, this story had to be Romanized so the, the, you know, the chief character had to become a peacenik. Uh, he had to render unto Caesar what belongs to Caesar. Uh, he had to turn the other cheek. So he was no longer you know, a, uh, a warrior fighting against Rome. And to completely, because lots of people have obviously knew this history, to divorce him from this history, they threw his story back by 40 years. And that's the chronological chasm. And they threw him back into the AD 30s, early AD 30s, so that you wouldn't find him, that no one would know who this character was. Because you can look for your whole lifetime in the AD 30s and not find the Jesus character. But if you look in the AD 60s, it's pretty obvious he's there. Okay. Um, have the Antiochian kings uh, played a part in your theses uh well it depends what antioch you mean isn't there an and an antiochus the third or something that oh uh, those kings no that's that's before that's the um greek era okay well uh, pardon pardon my ignorance of history on on that yeah. but uh um okay would you connect edessa to the essenes in any way quite possibly because um I regard them as being the uh, Babylonian Jews from beyond the Euphrates. 
um, who in Josephus's work, we have two groups that came into Judea in the early first century. One was the Babylonian Jews who came in, they were actually invited in uh, because they'd been thrown out of Parthia. So they were invited in by, um, uh, by Herod and by um, Octavian. So we're talking early first century. They were invited in to make a buffer state, uh, a new principality, a new city state on the borders of Rome and Parthia because Rome and, and Parthia had been fighting each other so, so frequently with so many wars that it suited both parties to have this new principality established on the eastern borders of Rome uh, bordering with Parthia. And that was, in my view, Edessa. And, I see. And these people were invited in for that particular purpose and given those lands free of tax from Roman tax in order to create a buffer state between Rome and Parthia. And they were called the uh, Babylonian Jews from beyond the Euphrates. And they were called the fourth sect of Judaism because they became Nazarene Jews, as I said before. And it was the fourth sect of Judaism <laughs> who fomented the Jewish revolt. So now we know where the Jewish revolt came from, um, because if you look it up in, in any history book or if you look it up on Wiki, nobody will actually tell you why the Jewish revolt started, what it was all about. What was the purpose of this revolt? It, they will tend to say that it's, you know, it's, it's sort of an internal dispute within Judea. Um, it wasn't that at all really it was uh, it was a tax revolt the fourth sect were uh, against roman taxes why because they had been given their lands the lands of edessa and, and that the um, land to the east of the roman empire they were given those lands free of tax and later emperors like nero had gone back on that and had started to tax the edessans and of course, they said, well, that wasn't the agreement. We had this land free of tax. And that's why you get all these references to taxation uh, within the New Testament. That's why Jesus was so um, uh, friendly towards tax collectors, because he had his own tax collectors, because he had his own city state, the, the uh, principality of Edessa. And he was actually taking taxes for his kingdom. He didn't want to give those taxes to Rome. Um, and, and so we get uh, parables like the parable of the vineyard owner, uh, which um, the, I think it's the, the parable of the um, absentee landlord, which doesn't really make sense. If you read the parable of the absentee landlord, Jesus is promoting the rights of absentee landlords over the common people and saying, well, if the tenant doesn't pay his, his dues, his taxes, then we should kill him. Which doesn't really stand with, you know, the pauper prince of peace um, sort of character that we're supposed to be thinking about with this Jesus character. Right. But hold okay. on a minute. But hold on a minute here. Put it back into this Roman context. This is why I say that this story has been divorced from its Roman roots and from the history of this region. Um, make the tenant the Romans, make the landlord the Edessan king. Okay, so now what does the parable say? The parable says that the landlord owns this land, the Edessans land, uh, own the land, and they've got these tenants on their land, the Romans, but the tenant is refusing to pay his taxes. In fact, he's doing the opposite. The tenant is asking for taxes from the landlord. So what should <laughs> we do with these evil tenants? As it says in the Gospels, what should we do with these evil tenants, the evil Romans? Well, we should kill them. Now you see why this parable works. It doesn't work in, in terms of agriculture and land ownership. It works in the politics of this region at that time that this was a tax dispute where the Romans were demanding taxes from Edessa and the Edessans were refusing to pay. 
That's why Jesus says, render unto Caesar what belongs to Caesar. Don't render unto Caesar what belongs to us, for goodness sake, that belongs to us. You know, only render unto Caesar what belongs to him. This was a tax dispute, and that's why the um, Jewish revolt was started. And it was started by the Babylonian Jews beyond the Euphrates, the kings of Edessa. And Jesus was the son of the king of Edessa. So the king of Edessa was called King Abgarus Okama, uh, which means King Abgarus of Egypt, because he had an Egyptian ancestry. And his son was called King Isus Manu. And of course, the biblical Jesus was called King Jesus Emmanuel. Ah. He has, he has the same name. That's fascinating. Um, because that, that's been a mystery. For... Yeah. Yes, because yeah, this this prophecy doesn't work, does it? You know, the pro prophecy of Jesus. Uh, we know he's the Messiah because he will be called Emmanuel. And he never was. So he wasn't the Messiah. So the whole of the New Testament is a load of rubbish because Jesus was never called Emmanuel. Not once within the uh, New Testament. Right. Yeah, it, it's amazing. So the prophecy doesn't work unless you are in the know, unless you have been uh, initiated into the uh, Gnostic church who knew these original facts, this original history. You would not know what that prophecy actually meant. Uh, but of course, the prophecy does work because it says um, uh, he will be the Messiah because a child will be born who's called Emmanuel. Well, yes, he was. He was called Manu. That was the official name of the, you know, the, the, the next king of Edessa was called Manu, Manu the fifth and Manu the sixth. Um, yeah, the prophecy works fine if you know the history. I see. Did you encounter the name uh, Shaphat in, in some of your researches? I think it's re related to Elisha or something. Not really, no. No, okay, thank you. I just, I thought I had heard, I had monitored some of your interviews and thought um, I heard that mentioned. Uh, there are so many names, that's not one I recall. I might have written about it. All right. But, um, okay, there, that's there, fine. There are 10, there are 10 books in this series. Um, so there's, a, and some of them, at least three of them are 600 pages long. So we're talking about a lot of information here. Okay, so do I you... do the whole of the Old Testament, you know, from... Um, from Genesis all the way up to the United Monarchy. Uh, so we have books like Eden in Egypt and uh, Solomon, uh, Pharaoh of Egypt and things of that nature. And then we do the whole of the New Testament, uh, starting with Cleopatra to Christ, King Jesus, Jesus King of Edessa, and then the Grail Cipher, which is an add-on uh, because it goes into Arthurian legend. Uh, which is linked because the primary hero of Arthurian legend is Joseph of Arimathea. So we come back to these same characters again. Okay. Um, did you see any influence from Mithras cult upon Christianity? I don't know what you think of the Mithras. Yeah. Well, what do you think about? Well, we, we have the history. And again, it's, it's, you won't find this in the history books because people don't look at this. They they regard it as, I don't know, they regard it as not being history. But we have the history of Mithras from Arthurian legend. And before you like to dismiss that, you know, dear listeners and uh, viewers, a lot of Arthurian legend is very historical. So it's a vast corpus. I mean, most people they read one book, they read Monmouth, and they, they think they know Arthurian legend. And I had a go at uh, a historian in Britain who wrote a book of King Arthur, who only had read um, Geoffrey of Monmouth. Well, that's not Arthurian legend, it's a vast corpus. Um, a lot of my material comes from the Vulgate cycle. You know, the, the Vulgate cycle is nine vol volumes, about 5,000 pages of oh my. text. I mean, it's, it's a vast corpus of, of history. And within that mythology about King Arthur, there is a lot of real history. And one of the histories it gives, remember this is Arthurian legend, 
one of the uh, histories it gives is the secret history of Pompey the Great. Okay. Oh. The, the compatriot of, of Julius Caesar. Yes. And it gives his hidden history, which it says, this is not me speaking, this is Arthurian legend speaking, was deleted from his memoirs because he didn't want anyone to know about it. But somehow Arthurian legend does. And it gives the history of Mithras. And it gives a very, very different history to Mithras that from what we you know, generally understand. It didn't come from Persia. Um, it, it didn't come from uh, Mithras in, 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 uh, in Persia. Um, so what it says is that Pompey the Great became the admiral of Rome, which he did. He became the admiral in charge of the whole Mediterranean um, because of the uh, Pontus pirates. They had a plague of pirates over in uh, eastern, uh, the eastern Mediterranean, what is now sort of southern Anatolia. And so he became the chief admiral and he went over there to rid Rome of these Pontus pirates. And he was fighting against Mithridates VI in the Mithridaic Wars. Okay. And this is where Mithras came from. It had nothing to do specifically with, you know, Persia and Parthia. It came from Mithridates, the king of Pontus which is Anatolia. And as a part of this battle with the Pontus pirates, he was initiated into or gathered the history of Mithras. And it was something that was prevalent in the Eastern Mediterranean. And he took it back to Rome. And basically it's a... Um, it's a very old version of the Nazarene Church of Jesus and James. So <clears throat> this is something that they won't tell you about. This is, there are so many things that they won't tell you about within theology and modern history, is that the primary symbol of Judaism was the zodiac. And if you look at a modern synagogue today, you'll say, what? You know, that's... <laughs> got nothing to do with Judaism, is it? Well, <clears throat> all of the early synagogues that they've discovered in Judea and, and Jordan, they all have a, a zodiac on the floor. A like, large, the, like the Mithra, uh, Mithras uh, temple. Precisely. Mithras is, <laughs> is all about the zodiac. Um, <sighs> okay. And so going back into the Mithras one, of course, the primary symbol of Mithras is the zodiac but it's a particular part of the Zodiac. So it's not the entire Zodiac, it's a specific event within um, processional astrology. Uh, will your uh, listeners know about uh, procession? Uh, well, no, I, I'll quickly explain that if you'd like. Well, <clears throat> we, we can do this in, in like one minute. Um, All right. The Earth in its axis, this is real astronomy. So the Earth in its axis wobbles on its axis and it has a 26,000 year wobble. And what it does is it, it changes the constellations that rise uh, with the vernal equinox uh, every 2000 years. They change from one constellation, one zodiac constellation to the next. And so we can trace a history by looking at what zodiac was um, in, in vogue at that time. I call it the great months. And so the ones we're looking at are Taurus, Aries, and Pisces. And this is all to do with Judaism, as, as we will see. Now, the specific event that the Mithras uh, symbology is depicting is the death of Taurus, the bull. It's the okay. bull killing, the bull slaying. Right. That is the Tor Toctomy, I think they call it, which is the primary symbol of Mithras. That's the killing of Taurus. Um, well, we know when that happened. That's a specific event in time. And it's 1750 BC. So Mithras was way out of date by the time it got to Rome. That's why I say it was an old religion that um, wasn't really current anymore. Um, and what they're showing is Orion, so Mithras is Orion okay. 
killing uh, Taurus, the, the constellation of Taurus the bull. Now, right. That happened in 1750 BC when Taurus, the great month of Taurus, ceded to Aries, the great month of Aries, the, the lamb, the, the ram. And Taurus was killed and Aries became dominant. Now, that's what it's displaying. And funnily enough, it's exactly the same as the Epic of Gilgamesh. Exactly the same. <laughs> You're right. Yeah, I, re I recommend that people actually read Gilgamesh and they're just like, nah, yeah. nah, I don't have time for that. You know, I got my own vision. It's, and yeah, <laughs> well, so they, say it's, they say it's, you know, a story of an ancient Persian king, you know, a Babylonian king, but it's it's not. Gilgamesh is Orion. And the the task of, of Gilgamesh is to go and kill the sacred bull, the bull of heaven. Well, who's the bull of heaven? It's Taurus again. And but before he can get to Taurus, he has to kill the six humbaba, the dreaded humbaba that guard the neck of the uh, bull of heaven. Well, ah. who who are the six stars that guard the bull of Taurus? It's the Pleiades, of course. So we, we're talking about. Uh, a cosmic story here. It's got nothing to do with people on earth or kings of, of Babylon. It's a cosmic story of the slaying of Taurus, which happened in 1750 BC. And before he could get to Taurus, he had to slay the Humbaba, the Pleiades, which do sit on the neck of Taurus. So we know exactly what this story is trying to tell us. And it's exactly the same as the story in Mithras, which was taken to Rome by Pompey the Great um, in circa, I, I don't know, 50 BC or something of that nature. I forget when he was admiral, but something like 50 BC. Okay, and I so that is, okay, that is ahead, the story of, of, of Mithras. Okay. And do remember that this comes from Arthurian legend. That's where I've got all of this information from. So <clears throat> we should not dismiss these stories as outright mythology because they do contain details of history, if you know what they're talking about. Okay, was El seen as Gilgamesh or Orion? Uh, El, you mean the god El? The god El, yes. Was he seen um, as Gilgamesh <clears throat> or as Orion? There's been some speculation that he may have been Gilgamesh. Oh, I've not heard that one. No, I think El is is a uh, solar god. So El. Uh, oh, Elohim. okay, like Helios then. Yeah, he's he's the equivalent of Helios. He's the equivalent of the Artem, um, because the Jewish god had several names. And again, this is not highlighted very much within history and theology, because they don't want to tell you the truth, so they keep all of this to themselves. But the Jewish god had several names. He was called El Elohim Allah which is a familiar name you'll know today. Um, he was called uh, Shaddai, Yahweh, and he was called Adon. So okay, who is now, the god called Adam, Adon? Adam. No, no, no. This is Aton. This oh, is the, Aton. This okay. is the Egyptian Aton. Okay, okay, I Jewish hear it. the Jewish god. It's, it's the same. Because right. the D and the T are always confused. Again, um, again, yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, and so, yeah, the, the Israelites were worshipping the Aten, the god of Pharaoh Akhenaten. Okay. Um, and again, that changes the whole story. But that's a different, that's all Old Testament stuff. That's a different story. Okay. What do you think of Barossus uh, in uh, Genesis, what do you want, for instance? Do you want to stay in the New Testament? So we oh, don't okay. If, you, if you'd prefer, I don't mind. <laughs> Uh, no, I don't mind. Jumping I, around. I'm, I'm sorry that this is a jumped around thing. I, I have a jumble of questions that I yes. was not able to, to put in any logical order. Right. <laughs> sorry about that. And, and I don't mean to come off the cuff repeatedly, but I'm just curious about what your thoughts on it, on a number of, of things which surround the New Testament. May have influenced well, Barossus the New is Testament. not really connected to the New Testament. Um, it, okay, it okay, well, to get back to well, it, the, it would uh, depend on your thinking as to whether yeah. he was or not. Um, okay, do you see uh, the Lion Man figure? Uh, anything about that? Is this something of a 
a sun king or something? Well, the lion was was the symbol of Judah, um, but it doesn't really. Whereabouts in the New Testament are you seeing the lion? Uh, well, I'm I'm just thinking about uh, you had mentioned Gilgamesh, and I'm sorry, yeah. I'm, I'm stuck on yeah. that. But and uh, Gilgamesh would wore the lion. Perhaps if we skin. can get back onto Odessa or something of that nature. Okay, all right, all so right. I don't no think problem. we've explained the whole of that story yet. Okay, fine. Then then let me. Uh, how about uh, Christian ideas of hell? Are those attached to? Uh, the Romans or or where the Jews don't seem to have a, a three three choice hell or something like the Christians uh, seem to have. You could go to you could go to hell, heaven or purgatory or something. I, I, I don't really write much about that. I mean, it obviously comes from the um, um, the e Egyptian underworld, but I, I, I don't really. Oh, OK. Well, it. along with the idea that the afterlife is what we need to be looking at, it, it seems like, because that doesn't seem to be endemic to to Judaism. The you no. know, the an afterlife just doesn't seem to be that big of a player in Jewish thought. As it is yeah. in the Christian, Possibly, um, but I, I'm only dealing with history. I don't. OK, so and history. so you're saying that's Egyptian influence then. Yeah, I mean, the whole of this has an Egyptian influence because that's where they came from. Um, okay. The Jews came out of Egypt. Uh, the Jews were the Hyksos pharaohs of Egypt. Josephus Flavius says so. Um, and they came out of Egypt and they settled in Judea and they settled across the um, Mediterranean on many of the Mediterranean islands. Um, and they seeded many communities all the way across the Mediterranean. And so they were very influential because of that spread, that forced spread due to the exodus, um, due to the Hyksos exodus out of Egypt. When did that ha occur, please? Uh, 1580 BC. I see. Okay. But that was, that was the great exodus. Um, the the uh, exodus in the biblical story is exactly the same. We won't go it through it now because it's, it's, it's a whole different session. That's fine. Um, but it's ex exactly the same. But they say it happened in uh, 1280, 1260 BC. It didn't. It happened in 1580 BC. Uh, and we have this from real history. So again, that's another piece of, of biblical history that's been covered up because they don't okay. want you to know who the Israelites really were. All right. Well, in the New Testament, um, do we do we hear the authors kind of treating philosophers and atheists and Christians as as related sort of groups, like those who don't don't worship the traditional gods? Well, Rome didn't have a problem with this. It was only the the Jews that had a problem with it. Within Rome, they they were very much in favor of of syncretism. Um, that's the way they ran the empire and kept peace within the empire so they didn't have constant battles between different religious sects. Um, so when they conquered a region like Britain, they just went in and said, well, you know, your God here is the same as our Zeus or the same as our Apollo or something. And so you're worshipping exactly the same God as us. You've just got a different name for your God. Okay, and that's the right. way they kept. That's the way they kept the peace. Um, so they didn't have religious wars. You know, everyone was worshiping essentially the same gods, just with different names. The only people who uh, were against this idea um, were the Druids in Britain, and the Jews on the opposite side of the empire in Judea. Who, who refused to believe in any of the Roman gods, and they didn't believe that the emperor was divine either. And that was, you know, one of the reasons we had the Jewish revolt. There was a very, very big difference between difference of opinion uh, between the Roman aristocracy and what was going on in, in Judea. Um, okay. And this is probably why the Edessan monarchy wanted to strike out and, and take the throne of Rome, uh, because coming back to the Jewish revolt, this wasn't simply a tax revolt against Rome. We've already been through the reasons for that. It was an ambitious plan by the Edessan monarchs 
who at this time would have been King Manu, to take the throne of Rome, to become the next emperor. Because they had an oracle on their side, they had the star prophecy, uh, and the star prophecy said that the next emperor of Rome would be a king from the east, an Edessan king, of course. Um, and the throne of Rome was empty. So we, we, we come to AD 66 when Nero was on his last legs and he gets knocked off in AD 68 and the throne of Rome is empty for whoever could grab it. And four emperors come and go within one year. This was, this was the era of, um, uh, of four emperors. And so the throne of Rome was open to anyone who had a large enough treasury and a large enough army to grab it. Now, okay. what they won't tell you, they say it's the year of four emperors. It was actually the year of five emperors. And the fifth contender for the throne of Rome was the biblical Jesus. This ah. is why he was so important in this story. That's why they had to separate him from the AD 60s, because they didn't want you to know this, that he was trying to become the next emperor of Rome. And so when we came to the Jewish revolt, it wasn't simply a revolt of you know, Jews against Romans. This was a battle for the throne of Rome. And the two contestants were Vespasian, who was an army commander at that time. Of course, he was in charge of the army in Judea and the king of Edessa, who was King Esus Manu. And they were having this enormous great battle in Judea, not for the throne of Judea, but for the throne of Rome. And it was the Jesus character, the Esus character who lost this. And it was Vespasian who then sailed back to Rome to become the next emperor. Of course, if Vespasian had lost, then Jesus would have become the next emperor of Rome. And we know this is true because, of course, um, the leaders of the revolt were uh, crucified after the revolt failed, as we've been through. You know, the three leaders of the Jewish revolt were all crucified. And the Jesus character was crucified uh, while wearing a crown of thorns and a purple cloak. Well, the crown of thorns is the traditional crown of Edessa. All of the kings of Edessa wear a crown of thorns. That's why he was crucified while wearing, it wasn't, you know, a thorn of, a, it wasn't a, a crown of brambles. It was a proper regal crown of thorns. And he was given and, and again, people will never mention this. And so many people have looked at this story, historians, theologians, laymen, and nobody questions why Jesus was wearing a purple cloak. I mean, come on. I mean, that's the symbolism is so central to the whole, whole story here. The purple cloak was the symbol of the emperor of Rome. Only the Roman emperor could wear one. Uh, when Yuba the first uh, he was the king of Mauritania. When he went to Rome wearing a purple cloak, uh, he was executed for trying to undermine the authority and power of, of the emperor. So you, you don't just go around wearing a purple cloak for no good reason. Jesus was crucified while wearing a purple cloak because he was a pretender to the throne of Rome. That was the whole ambition of his revolt against Rome. They were dressing him up as a pretender to the throne of Rome, a failed pretender to the throne of Rome. I and see. That's the story of the gospel. Okay, so you you sound like you're at least partly in a a Flavian origin type hypothesis. Well, yes, lots of people have said that you know the story was invented by the Flavians, but they didn't have to invent anything because the story was there it happened many people knew it had happened josephus flavius wrote a whole history of of this event um but what the flavians didn't want to broadcast to everyone is that anyone could you know form a revolt against rome 
what they wanted was the Pax Romana, the Roman peace. And so what they had to do was undermine this revolt against Rome, to belittle it, to, um, to divorce its leaders from the events that they actually took part in. And that's what they've done. And they had a, a propaganda one-two on this. You know, the first hit was the real history of the Jewish revolt, which was written by Josephus Flavius. And that said, uh, Rome is all powerful. Don't mess with Rome. And of course, that story was not sent to Rome. I was going to say this earlier. That story, that book was not sent to Rome. It was sent to the Babylonian Jews beyond the Euphrates. Now, why write that enormous great book about all of these events in Judea and send it to the Jews beyond the Euphrates if they weren't involved in this Jewish revolt? Well, of course they were. They were the Edessans. It was the Edessan army that was threatening to come down into Judea and destroy the army of Vespasian. They were lucky that they didn't. And it was a lot of propaganda that actually stopped them coming down. Um, and the full army of, of the Edessan kings didn't actually back up the people who were down in Judea. And that's probably why they lost the Jewish revolt. Um, mm, so that was I the see. secular version of this story. And then they had the spiritual uh, version of this same story. It was like Kennedy. Is, is <laughs> it was like... Yeah. It was like Kennedy at the Bay of Pigs is what it sounds like. <laughs> yeah, but they, they had the two stories. And so, uh, you know, they didn't want to uh, praise this guy who had made this revolt against Rome. So in the secular story, they've deleted him from this his, the story completely. His name does not exist in the works of Josephus. So you don't really know why this revolt happened and and who led this this particular revolt okay and then in the uh, spiritual story <clears throat> they 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 changed him from a warrior prince into a pauper prince of peace and said he lived in the in the 1830s you know and so okay. they separated him from this story completely and nobody ever si since uh has discovered the real truth of this story and well i i i I say that guardedly because I'm pretty sure that the Knights Templar knew this story and I have good, good evidence that they did know this story. And that's probably one of the reasons, uh, maybe the reason why the Knights Templar were all destroyed uh, on Friday the 13th, 1307, which is why Friday the 13th is unlucky for some, of course. Um, these things propagate down the uh, centuries and we still think of that as an unlucky day, because that was the day that Knights Templar were all rounded up and killed. Okay. Um, do you use Eusebius in your your writings? No, because he was he he was a lying toad. So okay, know. okay, that's a, yeah. You're not the first to to make that observation, <laughs> right? Um, I mean, <laughs> th there are some interesting bits. He preserved the um, doctrine of Adai so he had a, a second version of the doctrine of Adai but you, you can see how deceitful he was because the doctrine of Adai has been doctored it's, it's been deliberately altered and falsified to agree with the gospel story and this is the trouble we have with all of the history of this region in this era is it's all been distorted because these events happened in the AD 60s and AD 70. But the biblical story has dictated that you must say it happened in the AD 20s and AD 30, the chronological chasm. And so every story has to be doctored and altered to fit with that new dating. So on the doctrine of Adai, which is these letters being sent between uh, Jesus and the, the king of Edessa, um, if you look at the emperor, the emperor agrees with the AD 30s, AD 20s, AD 30s, to agree with the biblical story. But if you look at the, um, the governors of Syria, they don't. The governor of Syria is an AD 50s character. 
So you can see that Eusebius was so stupid, he changed the um, name of the emperor to give the right date, but forgot to change the um, governor of Syria. And so it's pretty obvious that the doctrine of Adai was written in the AD 50s and 60s, not in the AD, um, uh, AD 30s. Okay. Um, did you uh, study... Uh... I, I understand the Adiabene kingdom had some presence in Asia Minor, and I'm wondering uh, what your studies say about places like Anatol Anatolia, having Caria, the Dolache region, or Ithaca, where Odysseus comes from. Well, I, I don't think the Adiabene had any presence really in, in uh, Anatolia. Oh, okay. Um, okay. I must, I don't know where I got that from. But, well, uh, I mean, they didn't, it, it depends what you class as Anatolia. They, they did in terms of Edessa, which is now in modern uh, Turkey. So you, would, you, you could say that that was Anatolia. Um, but their kingdom spread east from Edessa. So uh, Edessa was in the northwestern corner. They had a sort of rectangle of land that went right. from Edessa which is north of, uh, where, where can we locate it? It's north of Aleppo in modern Syria. Uh, keep going from Aleppo up a little bit into modern Turkey and you'll come across Odessa just there. And right, well, that's Iona. Principality... Sorry, that's what? That's Iona you're talking about, right? This is Greek, no. gr isn't this Greek speaking Turkey? Or... Oh, well, it, it was all Greek at that time. I mean, the whole of Persia was Greek. Um, oh. It had only just become Parthia. Um, oh, okay. Up up to like 100 BC, the whole of Iran and Iraq and Afghanistan and northern India, all of that was Greek. Oh, okay. Um, and, and, you know, it was all conquered by uh, Alexander the Great, and it was um, uh, part of the Seleucid Empire of Greece. So, yes, a lot of these regions were, were Greek-speaking. But the difference with Edessa is it was, at the time, it was um, Aramaic <laughs> speaking. So it was different. Ah, the, uh, okay. And this is why Josephus himself says he couldn't speak Greek. And I, I, again, a lot of modern historians are rather confused on this because if you, if you look at um, all of the works of Josephus are in Greek, of course, but they weren't. The original books that Josephus wrote were all in Aramaic, and they make a lot more sense if you translate them into Aramaic. And they oh. were sent to the Babylonian Jews below, beyond the Euphrates, the Edessans, because they spoke Aramaic. And that's why he wrote it in Aramaic, because that was the only language he could speak. And he was an ambassador of Edessa, and that's why he spoke Aramaic. And as he says, he could not... Um, he could not speak Greek well enough to translate these books. And so he got his publisher to do it. And the publisher was um, Epaphroditus. Ah, okay. Now, the funny thing is the publisher of Saul, St. Paul, was Epaphroditus. Um, so, yeah, um, there are many links here. And okay. it was, that was the way that these books got translated into the Greek and therefore put out to the Greek world and the Roman world. Okay, so in, your, in your writings, in your writings, do you employ Masoretic or Midrashic sources? Well, yes, because the Talmud is very important in this story and it belies the arguments by the mythicists, like people like Richard Carrier and so on, who ought to know better, who say that Jesus is a mythical, character he's fictional um and i don't know how he can say that because well I, I i think i do know how he can say that because i don't think he had ever read the talmud because i had an argument with him uh, online uh, some years ago and i pointed out to him that jesus is in the talmud and the talmud dislikes jesus a because they say uh he destroyed jerusalem as the leader of the jewish revolt um, and they say very nasty things about him, ah. uh, which I can't even mention here, really, um, that he should be killed. And the problem is, 
why would the, these are the uh, rabbis from the first century onwards up to the fourth and fifth centuries? Why would the rabbis be talking about a fictional character? Okay. Why would they bother themselves? I mean, it would be like you know British law uh, having because the Talmud is is Judaic law and Judaic history. It would be like British law having big arguments about Robin Hood. Well, no, it, it doesn't have lots of data about Robin Hood because he's a fictional character. However, the Talmud contains lots of arguments against Jesus, um, which it, he, it calls by many names, but he also calls him uh, Joshua as well. It calls him uh, Jesus. Um, and why would they be talking about him if he was a mythical character? It sort of implies, strongly implies, that he was a real historical character. What does it say? I've, I've got a quote here from Sanhedrin 43 in the Talmud. All right. And it says, on the eve of the Passover, Jesus the Nazarene was hanged. He was not, uh, was he not an enticer uh, of whom scripture says, neither shalt thou spare and neither shalt thou conceal him. However, with Jesus the Nazarene, it was different because he was connected with the government and with royalty. Okay. Okay. If you don't... Well, that's that's a, well. Just very quickly, that's Go a right very ahead, different sir. Jesus to the one that's promulgated in the Gospels. Of course, um, a it's, he's a real character. He's Jesus the, the Nazarene who was hanged on the eve of the Passover. Okay, same as the Gospel stories, um, but. With Jesus the Nazarene, he was connected with the government and with royalty. Mm -hmm. Now that's a very different Jesus to the one that's that's um, been uh, promoted by the uh, by the Gospels, and that's why they won't mention it. So they won't even mention that Jesus is in the Talmud. And I put this to Richard Carrier, and he said, "Don't be stupid. Jesus is not mentioned in the Talmud." So I gave him the various quotes from the Talmud. And I did note in a recent lecture, he was actually saying, oh, of course, there we, we, we see these references to Jesus in the Talmud. Oh, well, thank you, Richard Carrier, for changing your mind all of a sudden. Um, <laughs> but he still doesn't agree that this means that Jesus has to be a real historical character because the rabbis would not be talking about a mythical or fictional character. All right. If you if you don't mind, I'd like to get two more opinions from you and then perhaps wrap up the webcast. Yeah. OK. All right, sir. Uh, what is your opinion that uh, early Christianity was either exclusivist where you you couldn't attend any other cult or, or may not have been? What, what, what do you think? Could you could a Christian well, go down to Apollo's cult or or what? Uh, you have to define what Christianity is first. Um, so you've, again, coming back to what we said before, uh, you've got to remember that Christianity has nothing to do with Jesus and James. They were not Christians. They were Jews. They were Nazarene, Ibeanite Jews. Nothing okay. to do with Christianity. Christianity was the enemy of the church of Jesus and James. Okay. Christianity was invented by Saul as simple Judaism for the Gentiles. So it was a very, very different church. Um, if you come to the church of Jesus and James, uh, of course, they uh, ran accord, according to Mosaic law. You were not allowed to have anyone join the sect who was not a Jew, same as modern Judaism today. Uh, it's very, very difficult to become a Jew and join Judaism, except through marriage. I see. Um, whereas the church that Saul set up, simple Judaism, I say, I called it, would preach to anyone. He was the uh, apostle to the Gentiles. And so, of course, anyone could join that particular church. Uh, as long as you put some money in his collecting plate, he was happy. Um, that was the church he invented. Uh, it was a very different animal to uh, Nazarene Judaism. I see. Okay, and then my last question is, what do you think of Mr. Atwell's contributions to uh, with Caesar's Messiah and his other writings? Well, it's, 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 it's well worth reading. I've had a few uh, talks with, with Joe, and his books are well worth reading on this subject because 
he again does this synergy between the gospel story and the, the, the history of the Jewish revolt. So again, he's putting the gospel story back into my era, the AD 60s and AD 70s, saying it's to do with the, the Jewish revolt. The difference is, is that he is still thinking of the New Testament as being a mythical story, a story invented by the Romans, invented by Vespasian um, for political purposes. Okay. Well, I'm he does seem to have a knack to read Josephus. He, seem, he seems yeah. to be able to read Joe like hardly anybody ever did. Yeah. Uh, yes. H him and myself were the first people who have really read Josephus Flavius with an open mind and, and, and linked it back into the gospel story. We've both done exactly the same. The difference between us is I've said that this is real history because the the Flavian emperors didn't have to make up this history. It was there right in front of them. It was the Jewish revolt. And they had a tame Jew who they could use to write this history, uh, Josephus Flavius, who was working for the uh, Flavian emperors. So they didn't have to invent this story at all. It was a real story. And all they did with it is they made it into Roman propaganda. So they made this Jesus character a peacenik. He wasn't fighting Rome. Of course, nobody fights against Rome. He was a peacenik. He was, pre he was preaching uh, peace. He was, ben uh, he was um, uh, bearing the other cheek. He was paying his taxes to Rome. Uh, he was just perfect for the Romans. But that was just obviously, that was just propaganda. The Romans didn't want you to know the real history of the Jewish revolt. And it's worked because nobody, you know, for 2000 years has made the connection between the Jewish revolt and the gospel story. But it's, it's all there if you read it. If, if you can just overcome that uh, chronological chasm, as I call it, if you can put the AD 30s story, the gospel story into the AD 60s, you will see it all. It's all there. Okay. Well, thank you very much for this fascinating interview, Mr. Ralph Ellis. And I hope we get to talk again in the future. My pleasure. Thanks for having me on. Very good. I'll shut it on down. Have a good day, sir. Okay. Thanks very much for that. Yeah. All right. Um, give me a shout when it's uh, up online. I presume you're going to put it up on YouTube or something. Yes. I will. I will send it you, sir. Yeah. Okay. That's marvelous. Very good. Excellent. Thanks very much.